In 2013, Holmes and Belwani struck an equally puzzling business partnership. Theranos announced a major deal with drugstore giant Walgreens to deploy the device in its Palo Alto and Arizona stores, despite the device's design for home and doctor's office use. Under a $140 million contract, Walgreens would become the exclusive pharmacy to offer Theranos tests and someday in more than 8,000 U.S. stores. Walgreens got enamored with the notion of putting one in every store so that you as a customer could come in and have your blood test done while you shop. In a carefully worded press release, the company said consumers can now complete any clinician-directed lab test with as little as a few drops of blood, with results available in a matter of hours. It went on to say that blood samples would be drawn either from a tiny finger stick or a microsample using traditional methods. The Walgreens partnership made Holmes a darling of business and tech media. Her story catapulted to the covers of magazines and to the front pages of newspapers. Under Holmes and Belwani's management, in 2014, Theranos' funding spiked to 400 million. She was on every cover looking her Steve Jobs best. Everyone called her the next Steve Jobs, and it was just wonderful. I mean, I, I, I don't know a CEO who wouldn't kill to have that kind of positive publicity. Wired first reported Theranos' analyzer could perform hundreds of blood tests, and as many as 30 from a single drop. Holmes soon boasted to Fortune that 70 different tests were possible from a finger stick sample and that Theranos offered more than 200 common tests. The bold claims elevated Holmes to her first cover feature. Um, I was the editor, Tim was the story editor, and Roger Parloff was the writer. And we were excited about it. It sounded, you know, just like everyone else said back then. I mean, this was like the next big thing, you know, and there was a lot of enthusiasm about it and a lot of interest, certainly. It was already a good-sized company with 500 employees. It was represented by David Boyes, who at that time was sort of the preeminent uh, attorney in the country. And uh, it had backing from Larry Ellison and Betsy DeVos. TechCrunch also interviewed Holmes in the peak of her company's ascent. This is the amount of blood that's needed to draw to do a test. A lot of private companies were getting a significant amount of funding, so it, I think it was valuations were just high across the board, and there was a, a sense uh, I, there was a lack of circumspection, I guess, around what was going on in the industry. Forbes followed suit, publishing a cover feature of its own. They were kind of saying she may be the next big thing, like visionary, guru, Silicon Valley, big deal, young. A lot of CEOs, sometimes they can be very controlling, and she just had none of that. I think even at that point, Forbes was already telling me that she was apparently America's youngest self-made female billionaire. The coming out party lasted nearly two years, as Holmes purported to disrupt the multi-billion dollar diagnostics industry dominated by companies like Quest, LabCorp, Siemens, and Abbott. Meanwhile, Walgreens customers relied on Theranos-branded tests, and the company's valuation soared to nine billion. The company grew to more than 800 people on its payroll, including former Apple OS X developer Avi Tavanian, eventually asked to resign from the Theranos board, and chief scientist Ian Gibbons, a 30-year biochemistry expert who in 2013 took his life after receiving a subpoena to testify in the patent dispute with Holmes' former family friend. There's a little bit of irony in the photograph now. It's like the, fire, like the firehouse catching on fire. What you're seeing in that photograph, it's exactly what is not supposed to happen. By that time, U.S. attorneys say Holmes was peddling a fraud. The accusation was first waged in an October 2015 Wall Street Journal expose. Reporter John Carreyrou skewered Holmes' claims that her technology could accurately process hundreds of tests using the finger stick technique. But it really wasn't until uh, John Carreyrou's story um, in the Wall Street Journal came out that we had any understanding that there was less here than met the eye. Whistleblowers who informed Carreyrou's reporting compounded the damage, claiming the analyzer returned enough false positive 
and false negative results that the company was forced to run all but one test on traditional equipment made by the very companies Holmes aimed to disrupt. Even if you could test blood on third-party equipment, they were diluting that blood mm -hmm. on equipment that was not made for diluting that blood. Their defense was, well, we did have the technology, and it was on, not on our box, but it was on third-party equipment in their testing and in their quality assurance and all the things you're supposed to do at a lab. They were, if the numbers didn't work out, they were, they were uh, playing with uh, the samples they used and, um, it's questionable. At the heart of the Justice Department's indictment are accusations that Holmes and Belwani lied about Theranos technology to dupe investors and business partners into forking over cash and to dupe patients into paying for Walgreens-based tests. Claims further examined in Kerry Roo's nonfiction book, Bad Blood, and in Alex Gibney's documentary, The Inventor. And the question is, did she know she was perpetuating a fraud or was there something more mysterious going on? I think she is uh, afflicted with what the police call noble cause corruption. Meaning, simply put, it's like the end justifies the means. Holmes and Belwani's knowledge will be key to their defense, given prosecutors' burden to prove intent, a non-negotiable element required to obtain a conviction. Well, this, that's what makes this a difficult story to draw conclusions about in terms of investment fraud, because I don't think anyone disbelieved this story, including Elizabeth Holmes, at the outset. By 2010, seven years after Holmes started Theranos, is when U.S. attorneys say she and Belwani began a conspiracy that by 2015 would include lying to investors about the range and accuracy of tests, faking product demonstrations, misrepresenting projected revenues, and fabricating stories that Theranos' device had been deployed in military combat zones. By 2013, prosecutors say the two knowingly promoted and delivered tests likely to contain inaccuracies and falsely represented to investors that the test did not require FDA approval, a point Holm has contested, along with pleading not guilty to criminal charges. When I started, um, we were, they had scrapped the Edison device, so we were working on the next generation, um, you know, black box. It was 2015, a month before Carrie Rue revealed what Jocelyn Bailey and other Theranos employees already knew. More than 90% of Walgreens-based tests use neither the mini lab nor tiny blood samples, and instead came from traditional larger volume blood draws processed by traditional analyzers made by Siemens. Bailey's job was to develop immunoassays, a common type of blood test intended to run inside the mini lab. Did you know about the Siemens machines being used while you were working there? Yeah, yeah, we knew. I think it, it, was, it was communicated to me, yeah. Our team knew about it. Um, I don't know if everyone knew. We knew that finger sticks had been cut or had been cut real recently from the clinics. Some of those original claims were known. You know, it, it hurts, but we, we knew it and we were in the lab trying to make it better. The revelations turned Fortune's cover story on its head. It was, became clear that they couldn't accomplish the tests that they wanted to uh, using the Edison machine. Then in fairly short order, it unraveled when some of the technicians uh, blew the whistle on it. One whistleblower, Tyler Schultz, a Theranos employee and grandson to board member George Schultz, disclosed the shortcoming to the Wall Street Journal and filed a complaint with New York State's Department of Health saying the company had manipulated proficiency testing, a process meant to promote test accuracy. At a minimum, if the Theranos Walgreens 2013 press release and home statements to media were to be believed, with as little as a few drops of blood, its device should have been able to accurately process multiple, if not more than 200, common diagnostic tests. Did it make you question the technology or not necessarily? 
you definitely realize that 220 assays on a single drop of blood on the same machine that you developed, that's, that's not feasible. And so you realize that their goal was to have it in all these wellness centers and have the price be cheap and all this kind of stuff. You understood why they were using these commercial analyzers. You didn't realize, I guess, the extent of how much they had pitched their own machine and how the public was understanding that everything was being done on our technology. When reporters pressed Holmes on the inconsistencies, she admitted that only one finger stick test was commercially available using the mini lab, a single assay for herpes virus HSV1. The rest, Holmes said, remained in R&D or awaited approval. In 2016, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid notified Theranos of laboratory deficiencies posing immediate jeopardy to patient health. The agency sanctioned the company and agreed to a settlement, banning Holmes from owning or operating a clinical lab for two years. The agreement forced the company to shutter its Walgreens and laboratory operations. Holmes' defense wasn't enough to quiet her most formidable critics. A flood of lawsuits followed. Arizona's attorney general, investors, and the SEC claimed fraud. Walgreens sued for breach of contract, and the Justice Department filed criminal charges for conspiracy and wire fraud. Did Holmes ever explain to you why she maybe embellished what her product could do? No, uh, although she didn't have to. You know, it's not uncommon for entrepreneurs in particular to talk in the present tense about the future. My product can do this. Well, your product's not built yet. <laughs> you know, your product is a bunch of concept. Uh, but nonetheless, the tendency is to say, my product can do this, or my service can unify people. But no, no, that's, I mean, it's a, it's a way of essentially describing a future vision. And Elizabeth was very good at that. Aside from the DOJ's criminal action and a civil suit filed by Theranos customers, Holmes settled the lawsuits out of court. The company paid Walgreens around $25 million to settle its breach of contract claim and separately agreed to pay nearly $5 million to Arizona customers. A $500,000 fine was paid to settle the SEC's claims of fraud. Among other stipulations, Holmes relinquished her controlling stake in Theranos and diverged from Balwani, who continued to defend the SEC's claims. Catherine said his clients recouped their investments. Still, most of the $900 million Holmes raised came from investors who took no legal action against her. So they all uh, sort of circled the wagons uh, around Theranos and, uh, and didn't go after them. Uh, in fact, they did reach an agreement not to go after them uh, early on. That overwhelming capitulation by the very investors who prosecutors say were victims of fraud begs closer examination of Silicon Valley status quo and the contributing roles of the parties that power its big ideas. Hi everybody, Alexis Keenan here. Yahoo Finance wants to extend a huge thank you for watching our YouTube channel and to tell you that there's a lot more here that you can check out, including Yahoo Finance's very first documentary film, Valley of Hype. It's a deep dive into Silicon Valley's startup culture and the embattled biotech founder, Elizabeth Holmes. You can watch that right here starting August 30th. And don't forget to hit your subscribe button.